everything is going super smoothly, but we're still going to let the media participate at each step. And I think in 2010, we'll have lots of cars built, and uh, we'll start using a lot on the public highway. We'll have test fleets and media events. I think by the end of 2010, every accredited journalist in the world will have, will have driven it. And even some other credit. <laughs> Wait, no. Harvey, uh, Wait, let, 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 sorry. We got, because we're running out of time, guys. Is there somebody down here just, yeah, go. Uh, given that we're two years out, basically, from the first production on the the floors, uh, are you at all concerned about bold fatigue in the media and the, and the consumers? You mean fatigue? Yeah, it's, yeah it's everybody, totally... said, everybody said that about the Camaro. I, I mean, I've gone through this at various stages in my career, you know. Dodge Viper, remember we showed it in 89, and we actually started production in 03, and everybody said, you guys are overdoing it. How, you know, how many magazine covers do you want? I mean, we're going to get tired of writing about this thing, and the public's going to get tired of hearing about it. But it, it never does die. And, uh, and something like the Vol, which is technologically unique, and where we will, as I said, with the uh, with the increasing sophistication and the increasing production quality vehicles that we'll be building over the next two years, we will give everybody ample opportunity to write. We test, we drive the almost final vault. We drive the final engineering vault. Scoop, we drive the production, pre-production vault. And, uh, we'll make sure that you guys don't get fatigued. <laughs> and I, I think we can, we'll be able to build, uh, build excitement right up to launch day, frankly. Because if, if it weren't so unusual, I, I agree with you. I'd say people are going to get tired of it. But, but this, I don't think so. Especially as long as other people say, we still can't do it. Oh, yeah. Who else? Yeah, I mean. Some people. <laughs> some people. Yeah, well, some of our, some some of our Japanese competitors have flat out stated, we, we had a, one of your colleagues this morning from the Toronto Global Mail saying he talked to Honda at a recent uh, Honda technical conference, and their people flat out said the Volt does not exist. It's not going to work. Um, General Motors doesn't know what they're talking about. If I were a serious journalist, I wouldn't believe that they're doing it mm -hmm. and so forth. So I mean, we do have this interesting, this interesting dichotomy between we who believe deeply in it are convinced it's going to work, and some of our highly credible competitors who say it won't. Well, that should keep things interesting for the media. <laughs> Quick, yeah, you're um, looking for incentives. The kicker in the press release was we'll build this if we can get these incentives. What are you looking for, and how do you get it in line ahead of AIG? Well, let's not get this all blended in with with the uh, financial system potential meltdown. But uh, we would be looking for hopefully an ideal number would be seventy five hundred dollars uh, incentive for the consumer, which would bring the list price down to a very affordable point. Uh, no guarantee that we'll get that, but yes, hi. yes. Hi, uh, I was wondering what's the business case. For the Volt, I mean, obviously, it's bringing a lot of interest to GM, GM yeah. products. But like you said, the break-even price is what you got to sell it for. What's the business plan going forward? Can this be a major money maker for GM? Yeah, if, uh, I will tell you, Generation One, which is has a lot of belt suspenders and duplicative engineering in it, it's going to be very tough to get a return on that initial investment. But as the technology matures and as the volume builds, uh, it you see the cost coming down, and I can see the day where uh, I can honestly forecast the day when the Volt technology will be no more expensive than a reasonable complex, reasonably complex internal combustion uh, vehicle, and about the same cost to produce. But um, if you then take that internal combustion vehicle and modify it to meet future in, in ever more stringent uh, fuel economy regulations, then I think you hit the crossover point where the extended range electric vehicle is cheaper, uh, especially as you, 
you get the economies of scale of the electrical components, and the, the electric motors, and, and the batteries, and all of that stuff, as that becomes commoditized, the costs will come down. So I think long term, the business case is going to be excellent. Uh, short term, short term, the only way you could justify it is that it's billions of dollars worth of favorable publicity for, for which and we buy that by only, by only spending for a product for One, Anybody else down there? If not, I've got time for one question. Go. Hey, I read in some of the cost estimates sort of the worst case scenario is that each volt will need a new battery pack while it's under warranty. Yeah. What are some of the features? Can you talk about that a little bit or also some of the service issues that you're expecting? I, I, I don't think we know what the service uh, issues are, but you're right that our initial, without confirming what you say, our initial assumptions for warranty, and it's one of the reasons why the business case doesn't look good, is we assumed a huge percentage of battery replacements. Now that we're into getting more and more vehicles running under various conditions that have never had the slightest battery problem, we're thinking that maybe we can start modifying that down. And if we can get rid of a good percentage of that warranty provision, the, the vehicle will suddenly be in the black, at least on a on a variable margin basis. The um, yeah, I was going to make a point there. Uh, the warranty battery. Sir, oh sir, yeah, sir, the sir, other sir. thing is the other thing is we had conservatively assumed that if an element went bad, that's one cell or a module, uh, that we'd have to swap out the whole battery. And I think the first 1,000 or 2,000 vehicles, if, if and when something goes wrong with the battery, we will probably tell the dealer, drop the whole battery pack, put it on a pallet, ship it to us, we want to diagnose it, we don't want you taking that lid off. But as we gain experience, we will have dealer installed or dealer available diagnostic tools where the dealer, we've got five modules in there. And uh, each module is about the size of a lead acid battery. And if you look inside that, there's a, there's a whole bunch of lithium ion cells. We don't want them to get into the cell level and start swapping out these cells, which are like in, uh, in Ziploc bags. But we will want them to swap out modules. And the, the modules, again, they just unscrew and unplug. And, and we, when we did the warranty calculation, we weren't thinking of swapping out modules. We were thinking about swapping out whole packs. So I, th I think over the next year or year and a half, we're pretty confident that we can drive that warranty assumption way down. The other thing is, I made a point with the other group, most people who have questions about lithium ion batteries are assuming that we will do the same thing that is done on devices like this, which is we're going to charge to like 99.5% and discharge to empty, but where you fully cycle the whole capacity of the battery. And we know that that's stressful for lithium ions, so we're taking a very conservative approach.